The Week in Review is back. Tis time to get this thing on. We've got a bunch to cover today. A lot of news in the Murdoch Murders true crime saga. A lot of ground to cover on that story. We're going to talk taxes as two new big plans were unveiled in the South Carolina General Assembly that could impact your wallet, your bottom line. We're going to look at Nikki Haley's hard choice. And no, that's not what you think it is. And on top of that, we're going to discuss my recent suspension from social media, which allowed me to have one productive morning at the office this week. And finally, if you're wondering why I'm sounding so mellifluous today, we're going to talk about our new mics and the expansion into the podcast arena. All that and more coming up on your Week in Review. At the top of our agenda this week, the Murdoch Murders True Crime Saga. And again, this is a story which has captivated the entire country and has held the attention of the country for many months. It involves a very powerful family from the South Carolina Low Country and a powerful law firm founded by that family and many of the institutions which worked with the family and the firm to advance a very curious definition of justice in this Low Country region of South Carolina. Now, The eyes of America were first turned to the Murdochs in 2021 after a brutal double homicide on the family's hunting property uh, known as Mazelle, which is on the border of Colleton and Hampton County, South Carolina, along the Salkahatchee River. Uh, This was a horrific crime, which attracted national attention uh, and continues to draw attention given the fact that it remains at this moment unsolved, although 53-year-old Alec Murdoch One of the prominent members of this family, an attorney in Hampton, South Carolina, is viewed as a person of interest in the case and is believed to be tied forensically to the crime scene, which we exclusively reported last month. Now, before this homicide, the eyes of the state were drawn to the Murdochs in 2019 when the family was involved in a fatal boat crash. And in that incident, a 19-year-old from Hampton, South Carolina named Mallory Beach was killed when a boat driven by 22-year-old Paul Murdoch slammed into a bridge in Beaufort County, South Carolina. Now, this was the case which dragged the Murdochs sort of out of the shadows and into the limelight. And it was the case that really got public attention focused on this family for the first time in a meaningful way. But I want to rewind the clock even further back. I want to go back to 2015, specifically July 8, 2015, around 4 a.m., when the body of another 19-year-old teenager in Hampton, South Carolina, was found lying in the middle of a road, Sandy Run Road in Hampton County. This is the story of Stephen Smith. And for regular readers of Fitz News, you're very aware of the Stephen Smith saga. And in fact, the Smith saga became part of this Murdoch murder story when the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division opened a criminal investigation into his death shortly after the double homicide. Again, with all this national attention, all this focus on the family, uh, finally, the Stephen Smith case uh, started gaining some attention. Now, why is this important? Why is this story so gripping? Why is it so relevant? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because, again, in 2015, we were operating in a period when the Murdoch family had total control over everything that happened in Hampton, uh, in this entire circuit, For uh, to be clear. Uh, it was a time when the family could do literally as it, w- as it wished, uh, where they dictated, pulled all the levers of justice. And it was a time when they could get away with basically anything. And what's interesting, and as we went back and started to study the Stephen Smith case, we found a number of troubling revelations regarding how his death was investigated. If you read the official autopsy report on the death of Stephen Smith, it reads that he was killed in a hit and run, a vehicular hit and run. Now, why does that matter? Why is that interesting? And I'll tell you a couple things. The investigators on the scene found absolutely no evidence of a vehicular strike. There were no tire marks. There was no debris. Um, Stephen Smith's shoes were still on. Usually if you're hit by a car, your shoes get knocked off, okay? Uh, There were no wounds consistent with a vehicular strike. There were no uh, shards or metal uh, or any sort of fragments uh, on any of his wounds that would have been consistent with a, a vehicular strike. So all the evidence pointed to his body being dumped there in the middle of the road. And in fact, the responding highway patrol officer noted that. The highway patrol investigator who came and walked the scene afterward noted that. 
there was absolutely no evidence that would indicate that it was a vehicular strike. So why was it termed that? Well, for that, we have to talk about Aaron Presnell. Now, Aaron Presnell is a forensic pathologist at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. It was Aaron Presnell who established this hit and run narrative through her official autopsy report and the preliminary report which preceded it. And according to Presnell, she relied on historical information. Uh, I'm doing air quotes here for those of you listening on the podcast. Historical information, which, again, she never specified, never provided. Uh, and again, to this day, there's no evidence has come forward indicating that this was a vehicular strike. But Presnell told one of the Highway Patrol investigators that the reason she determined it was a vehicular strike was that Smith's body was found in the road. Literally, that was it. The only thing that led her to assign the hit and run title to this autopsy was that his body was found in the road. So again, we de- we dug on this. Uh, our news director, Mandy Matney, has published numerous stories on the Smith uh, homicide because, folks, that's what it is. It's a homicide. This was not an accidental hit and run. This young man was killed and his body was placed in the middle of this road. Now, we looked through some of the notes from the Highway Patrol investigation, and some of the some of the notes that were made are are just shocking. And I wanted to read one of them to you here. This is from the notes of an investigator named Todd Proctor, who has since gone on multiple uh, news shows and confirmed all this uh, to those outlets as well. But it's something that I felt I wanted to pull up here on the screen and for and I'll read to you uh, for those of you listening on the podcast. Here's what Proctor said about Aaron Presnell, and I want to, uh, and I quote, I could see that our conversation was not going to yield any positive results. As I was leaving, she stated that the report she filed was preliminary and that it was my job to figure out what it was that struck him, not hers. Well, actually, it is her job. It is her job, but it gets worse. Proctor followed up uh, a, a month later. And in the case notes from the file, he referenced a conversation between the Hampton County coroner and Aaron Presnell. And in that conversation, Presnell told the coroner, and I quote, that she would change her report to read however he wanted it. However he wanted it. Now, this is a forensic pathologist, people. This is someone whose job it is to take medical evidence and to determine what happened. Their job is not to change a report based on what someone else wants. And the fact that that statement was made, again, if that statement is true, she should have been immediately disqualified from having any involvement in this case. Frankly, she should have been fired and never allowed to conduct another autopsy in the state of South Carolina again. Unfortunately, none of those things happened. Instead, her report, which alleged a hit and run in the death of Stephen Smith, was taken as gospel. And it remained gospel for another six years until the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division finally opened its investigation into this homicide. Now, based on all this information, I published an article this week which called for two things. Number one, an independent forensic review of Presnell's autopsy, uh, a independent analysis that, that takes a look at everything that she claimed to have factored in making her decision, including this alleged historical information, which she never provided, Uh, but also exhuming Stephen Smith's body. And again, I know that would be very difficult for the family. However, I'm told from sources very close to the family that they're okay with this, that they want the truth, and that they feel that the truth that was buried seven years ago needs to come to light, and that if that means exhuming Stephen Smith's body, that they're okay with it. Well, folks, I think we need to do that. I think we need to do that because there may be evidence under the surface that could tell us what really happened, what definitively happened, not just the assertions of a pathologist who clearly was willing to change her report based on whatever someone else wanted. Again, totally unacceptable. So we've called for that review, and as we continue to follow this story moving forward, uh, again, myself, Mandy Matney, our news director, and Liz Farrell, our executive editor, we're going to continue to push to hold not only Aaron Presnell and MUSC accountable, but every entity that's responsible for investigating these crimes. Now, while we wait to find out whether the Stephen Smith autopsy review will be conducted, whether his body will be exhumed to see if we can find out more about what happened, there were additional breaking developments in the Murdoch case this week. Now, 
unfortunately, we still do not have any criminal indictments from the boat crash obstruction of justice investigation, nor do we have any indictments related to the Moselle homicide. Uh, however, there was motion at the statewide grand jury this week, and there was also motion at another committee in Columbia, the little-known Office of Disciplinary Counsel. It's a division of the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, which is responsible for disciplining lawyers. Now, this group has already taken action against Alec Murdoch. They've already suspended his license in connection with some of the financial crimes he is facing. But we learned this month that the ODC, as it's called, is also investigating other members of the Murdoch law firm, perhaps even his brother, Randy Murdoch, who was a, a former uh, partner of Alec Murdoch's at the PMPED law firm. Now, one of the interesting facets of the ODC investigation is some stuff that I exclusively reported on back in September and October of last year, and that was Alec Murdoch's proximity to an alleged drug smuggler by the name of Barrett Boulware, and not just his proximity, but the proximity of the Murdochs and the Boulwares dating back for decades. Now, that has been the subject of the last two editions of the Murdoch Murders podcast, which is produced by our own news director, Mandy Matney. And I had the opportunity to appear on that show this week uh, for the second time. And I wanted to take a moment and let you guys listen to a cut from that program. Why would anyone need to steal millions of dollars from people who desperately needed it? Where was all of that money going? And did all of this have anything to do with the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch? So for years, my news outlet has advocated on behalf of individual income tax relief, which basically means letting you keep more of your money. This matters because in South Carolina, most businesses are small businesses. And by that, I don't mean 10 or 12 employees. I mean, they're one or two employees, they're sole proprietorships, they're LLCs, they're partnerships. So these are the folks that need tax relief along with individual working South Carolinians. And so that's what I've been arguing for years, that if we lower that income tax rate, which in South Carolina is one of the top marginal rates in the entire country, the highest in the Southeast, that we would have more economic activity, that we would be more attractive to businesses, that we would have higher income levels, that more people would work. Again, all good things. Now, South Carolina leaders have done absolutely nothing on that front. In fact, over the last 10 years, they have grown government by about a billion dollars a year. Again, taking every penny of new money that comes into Columbia and spending it on bigger government. Now, has that produced better outcomes for the people of the state? No. Drive our roads, visit our schools, look at our corrections agency, go down to our port facilities. Everything is moving in the wrong direction, people. More spending has not produced better government. And not only that, it has taken money out of the economy that could have helped people in a much more meaningful, material way. So the pressure is finally starting to pay off a little bit, though, because over the last few weeks, we have seen Republican politicians in South Carolina finally acknowledge that, hey, perhaps it's time to give a little bit of the money that taxpayers have been sending to Columbia back to the taxpayers. Now, let's look at the context in which they've decided this. Last year, the state budget in South Carolina was a record $32 billion. And again, it's grown by about a billion a year over the last decade. But on top of that this year, we've got $5.73 billion in new money on top of, again, last year's record-setting budget. So what did Governor Henry McMaster, Republican governor in his second term, how much tax relief did he propose? Only about $177 million. Now, I have, uh, I've gotten a little grief for this, but I've made some, uh, and for those of you listening on the podcast, I'm holding my uh, index finger up here uh, above my thumb uh, about an inch, making what is a, a juvenile penile joke, okay? But basically, it's weak. It's impotent. Henry McMaster's tax cut is basically the equivalent of a chode, people. Nothing. So, what, <laughs> sorry, I'm giggling at my penile joke here, but um, it's important because that basically amounts to three cents of every new dollar coming into Columbia this year. Again, on top, on top of the record government growth over the past decade. So, basically a nothing burger. Now, earlier this week, leaders of the South Carolina House of Representatives unveiled their tax cut. And it was a little bit better. I jokingly referred to it as a... Uh, a three-incher, right? Well, a three-incher, okay? 
Uh, and what they did was basically provide $600 million in upfront relief to taxpayers, a little more than three times uh, what the governor proposed. Now, governor's plan, house plan, again, we're looking at the margins here, people. And again, for those of you listening on the podcast, I am making my little finger penis jokes. Tiny penis. <laughs> but seriously, guys, when it comes to tax cuts, size matters. Size matters because, again, we're looking at competitive states next to us up in North Carolina, for example, where they've already dropped their top marginal rate down to just over 5%, and they're dropping it additionally over the next five years. They're going to get it all the way down to 3.99%. As a matter of fact, we're at 7 So where do you think businesses are going to go? Uh, this week, though, toward the tail end of the week, the South Carolina Senate unveiled what I would believe to be the first relatively substantive, and again, I'm going to use that term, you know, with all due respect, but a relatively substantive tax cut plan. Uh, This was introduced by Senate Finance Committee Chairman Harvey Peeler, uh, the most powerful member of that chamber, and Senator Peeler unveiled his plan with 28 co-sponsors in the Senate. And given that there are 46 members in the Senate, if you uh, weren't educated in a South Carolina government-run school, you can do the math there and you would know that that's more than half. So the bill has a good chance of passing. Now, Peeler's plan would take that 7% rate I was talking about and would cut it down to 5.7%, which again is now now we're getting somewhere, right? About, about a five inch, you know, five incher maybe. We're getting a little somewhere now with this tax cut. But the total value of that cut, $1 billion. $1 billion up front with only a, a, a minuscule amount of relief after that. Meanwhile, let's go to North Carolina they're providing $13 billion, $13 billion in relief to their taxpayers over the next five years. And again, that's on top of a decade of cutting taxes already in North Carolina. Context matters. Size matters and context matters when it comes to tax cuts. And on that front, I wanted to read something here. We were looking at, uh, at some of the competitive uh, comparisons between South Carolina and its neighboring states. Because it's not just North Carolina that's beating us on taxes. Georgia has spent uh, the better part of the last decade cutting taxes as well. But I wanted to read something to you. This was from a column two years ago, two years ago, by a man named Patrick Gleason, who uh, works for a group called Americans for Tax Reform. Now, here's what Patrick Gleason said. South Carolina used to be sandwiched between two states, North Carolina and Georgia, that also levied relatively high personal and corporate income tax rates, like those found in the Palmetto State. Yet... Recent years have seen North Carolina and Georgia lawmakers cut income tax rates, while South Carolina has remained in place with rates that are uncompetitive from a regional, national, and global standpoint. Again, Georgia and North Carolina cut taxes. South Carolina Republicans did nothing. And again, this was two years ago. And I'd like to point out here that over the last two years, from when uh, Patrick Gleason published this article, Over the last two years, South Carolina's General Assembly has been ranked the most liberal Republican-controlled General Assembly in America. Two years running. And folks, the proof is in the pudding. Politicians tell you all the time what they're for, what they're about. They say they're conservative. They say they're this. They say they're that. Here's the thing. You've got to ask them three simple questions, okay? Boil it down. Make them tell you, how much of my money are you going to spend? Where are you going to get it from? And what are you going to spend it on? Within those three questions, you can find the answers to anything you need to know about somebody asking for your vote, okay? So I want everybody to remember that when they hear about these tax plans and count on this news outlet rather than patting some of these guys on the back for claiming to come out with tax relief. Count on my news outlet to continue forcing them, pushing them to do better, to go bigger. Because, again, in in this state, one, three, and five inches just ain't going to cut it. Every four years, the eyes of America turn to South Carolina, where, for reasons surpassing understanding, both major political parties allow some of the lowest educated voters in America to pick the president. And, yeah, how's that working out, America? Anyway, South Carolina has had a starring role in the presidential preference selection process for decades, uh, and that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, So as we look forward to 2024... We've got a lot of interesting dynamics at play. There's the possibility that Donald Trump, 
the former president will run for the office he held from 2016 to 2020. There's the possibility that Joe Biden, the current president, might not run. Basically, we have a potential situation where both partisan primaries could be wide open affairs, or we could have a Trump v. Biden situation where both of those two uh, politicians suck up all the oxygen out of the arena. But whatever happens, we're getting a preview of that race this year in the form of some congressional races in South Carolina where Trump has come into the state to endorse challengers to two incumbents. Now, in the first congressional district, which is the Charleston area, the Buford area, the, the lower part of the South Carolina uh, low country, uh, Trump has endorsed Katie Arrington, a former state representative, in her bid against Nancy Mace, who is the incumbent. Uh, up the coast, uh, moving more toward the Grand Strand, toward Myrtle Beach area, Trump has endorsed a, another state representative, Russell Fry, in his bid against the incumbent Tom Rice. Now, Tom Rice, of course, is the one of 10 Republican lawmakers who voted last January uh, to impeach Trump, uh, a move that took a lot of folks by surprise. Some of those names on the GOP Trump impeachment list did not surprise people, but Rice, uh, his impeachment vote kind of came out of nowhere. But anyway, both Rice, who voted to impeach Trump, and Nancy Mace, who was highly critical of Trump uh, in the aftermath of the January 6 riots, uh, both of those Congress uh, members of Congress are on Trump's hit list. They are on his target list. He is actively trying to oust both of them from Congress during this election cycle. Now, why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting for a couple of reasons, because it's an early test of Trump's strength in South Carolina. In other words, we know Trump has been very popular with GOP voters across the country, particularly in South Carolina. But now we get a chance to see how far do those coattails extend now that he's been out of office for a few years? Uh, and do they extend to these challengers uh, that he's endorsed in the races against uh, Mason Rice? We also have another dynamic to consider. And those of you who followed South Carolina politics for a while know what dynamic I'm talking about. I'm talking about former Governor Nikki Haley. Now, Nikki Haley's relationship with Donald Trump is kind of like a yo-yo. One, one week it's one down, one week it's up. You just never know. It depends on kind of what the polls are saying, where the political winds are blowing. Uh, in fact, I think there was a famous cartoon, political cartoon in the Washington Post, which showed uh, Nikki Haley as kind of a weather vane when it came to uh, her like or dislike of the former president. But Haley started off as a never-Trumper. Uh, readers will recall that in the 2016 presidential primary, she endorsed Marco Rubio, U.S. Senator from Florida, who was perceived as the last bastion of the GOP establishment against the Trump insurgency. But Haley got beat. Uh, she and Rubio got beat badly in her home state while she was governor by this Trump MAGA insurgency populist movement. Now, let's fast forward to 2017 in January. Trump actually takes Haley, his former rival, uh, an avowed never-Trumper, and makes her his uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Now, why would he do that? Why would he gift a, a position like that to a former, former rival? Well, his reason wasn't actually any great love of Haley. Trump made that decision because he wanted to gift the governor's office of South Carolina to Henry McMaster, who was one of his earliest establishment supporters in the Palmetto State. So basically what he did was he cleared a path for McMaster to become governor by appointing Haley to the UN. Now, during her two years uh, in the Trump administration, Haley fought very often with the president, very often with the secretary of state. Uh, she was sort of an outlier in the administration, uh, and she left after two years uh, on decent terms. But in 2021, after the rioting at the Capitol, no Republican po politician in America, no rep Republican politician in the country went as far out in criticizing Trump, as aggressive in criticizing Trump as Haley. Uh, in fact, she gave a, an interview with Politico where she said that, you know, we followed him. He's taken us to a place we never should have gone. We can never let this happen again. She said that Trump had lost all relevance, that we could never listen to him again, that he would never come back, that he was done in the Republican Party. Well, guess what? The Republican voters didn't think so. For better or worse, they decided they were sticking with Trump. And all of a sudden, Haley, and for that matter, Mace, kind of left with their pants down, which uh, I will, no, I won't make that joke. <laughs> I don't think the podcast listeners would appreciate that with this new NPR microphone. But anyway, Haley was very vulnerable 
because she guessed that the GOP electorate would abandon Trump. And they didn't. They didn't. So Haley has spent the better part of the last year playing, you know, contorting herself, flip-flopping, going back and forth. Does she like Trump? Does she not like Trump? In fact, Trump himself has made fun of her saying, every time she criticizes me, she uncriticizes me 15 seconds later, which is pretty much how it's been. So here's the question for Haley. Haley has already endorsed Nancy Mace in the first district, going up against Trump's choice. So we've got a proxy war in the first district. But the question is, what will she do in the seventh district? Now, a lot of folks don't know this because they haven't been following parliamentary politics for a decade, but the reason that Tom Rice is in the U.S. Congress in the first place is that Nikki Haley lent him a critical endorsement back in 2012. That endorsement propelled him to a victory in a Republican primary over the former Lieutenant Governor Andre Bauer, and Rice has not been seriously challenged since. So Nikki Haley, in effort, in, in effect, was responsible for putting Tom Rice in Congress. Now she's in a position where she could conceivably help dictate whether he stays. But here's the problem. How on earth can Nikki Haley, who again was the tip of the spear in attacking Trump following the January 6 riots, how can she go after somebody who voted to impeach him? It doesn't make any sense. It puts her in a position of, well, you know, saying one thing, doing another, criticizing a guy or calling out a guy for basically doing exactly what she did. So, How Haley handles that is going to be very interesting because if she does endorse Rice, then we've got a full-on establishment versus Trump battle in South Carolina once again. And folks, it's going to be every bit as brutal as the battle was in 2016 when the Republican Party pretty much ripped itself in two in South Carolina in the advance of that 2016 primary. Now, as we look forward to that fight, the gloves have already started coming off, folks, particularly in the 1st District. In fact, we exclusively reported earlier this week on a push poll in the South Carolina 1st District. Now, this poll was going after Trump's candidate. It was targeting Representative Katie Arrington. And in particular, it asked some difficult questions about Arrington's tenure at the U.S. Department of Defense. Now, Arrington worked in the Trump administration at the Department of Defense for about two years, had a very decorated career up until the moment that she was uh, accused of leaking classified information to a contractor. Now, Arrington says that this matter has been resolved, that it's been settled. Uh, her attorney released a statement earlier this month indicating that everything had been settled, that the Defense Department was going to, in fact, pay her legal fees or some portion of her legal fees, which they almost never do. Uh, and Arrington indicated that this was uh, that the matter had been put to bed. Now, clearly, uh, if you read this push poll that was put out by someone clearly supporting Nancy Mace, uh, the issue is not over. Uh, and in fact, I've talked to several sources in Mace's camp who have made it abundantly clear that they plan on hammering this issue, hammering this issue, hammering Arrington on this issue in the coming weeks and months as this primary race heats up. Now, who will win? In the first district, again, I don't know. I keep hearing it's going to be closer than people think. Mace has a solid network of establishment Republican support. But don't forget, Katie Arrington ran for this seat and nearly won it back in 2018. She's got a solid network of her own. So, again, this proxy war uh, in the first district, which basically pits Nikki Haley's candidate versus Donald Trump's candidate, it's going to be a critical race to watch nationally as we try to find out which direction is the Republican Party going to go over the next few years and heading into the 2024 election cycle. Will it follow Trump, continue to follow Trump, or will Nikki Haley be able to pull off some wins in her home state and possibly give the party a different direction to follow? We'll be keeping a close eye on that on Fitz News and all the 2024 presidential news as that as that cycle begins to heat up. So I want to thank everybody again for tuning in to the Week in Review. We're getting good at this, aren't we? I think so. But um, I also want to tell everyone, if you want to support what we're doing, reach out to Andrea Holloway at FitzNews.com, Andrea at FitzNews.com. She's our advertising and marketing director. If you want to support this show or any of our other offerings, we'd love to have your help. Um, and grateful to everyone who's already supporting us and what we're doing. also want to thank Mandy Matney for letting us feature her uh, podcast in this program. Mandy is just the the queen of podcasts in this country. Again, one of the most successful shows in America. Uh, and she's just done an amazing job with it and was really honored 
to, to be on her show uh, for our second week this week, hoping to be back on. Um, as we continue this format, running it as both a video show and a podcast, which is something I'm getting used to, we're continuing to refine what we do, to experiment, to uh, try new things. And in fact, we've got some brand new microphones today, which is why I'm speaking to you in this incredibly sultry and mellifluous tone. I know you dig it, people, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, these are new mics, and I've only hit this one, what, twice during this program, I think? I've hit it twice, right? So, you know, I was just checking it or something. But um, the feedback we've been getting has been wonderful, and I uh, I got a little bit of feedback here that I did want to share because um, it's good, and I want to pump myself up or something. But this is some feedback that I just, I had to share, first of all, because, you know, I want to make sure that that my wife knows exactly what she's got here because, you know, I mean, let's face it, people, right? So let's listen. Um, And I won't say these names because, again, I don't want to embarrass anybody or land up in anybody's uh, divorce uh, court filings. But uh, this is from a reader who has a very nice cat emoji as her picture. I didn't know Will was kind of cute. Nice looking crew at Fitz. Why, thank you. To which uh, someone responded, He's so smart and very easy on the eyes also. I'm digging it. I'm digging it. Uh, We also had another reader who, let me see if I can find this. We've got to pull this one up here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Will has such a nice voice. It must be the microphone. It's got to be the new microphone, right? But um, but anyway, thanks to everybody, though, for, for their feedback. And again, whether it's good or bad, we want all of it because... It helps us do our job better. So if there's something you like, particularly my voice, I'm kidding. But if there's something you like, tell us. If there's something you don't like, tell us. If there's something we're not doing you think we should be doing, tell us. Because, again, that's how we're going to get better. Um, So email your feedback to me. I'm at w at fitznews.com. Or more importantly, send it to our director of special projects who is doing all this great video work and podcast work, Dylan Nolan. Dylan at fitznews.com. You can see these on the screen. Uh, But reach out to us and please give us the feedback because, again, it helps us improve what we're doing. And the better we do, the more we can hold those in power in South Carolina accountable because that's ultimately what it's all about for us. So thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. 